Hi, Angela. Thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me. Um, I wanted to start with um, animal rights. Um, the link between abusing animals and the world's health is, is clear. Um, but no one in a position of power seems to want to do anything about it. You are yourself a vegan. Um, what's your take on this? Well, of course, um, you don't have to be a vegan to be opposed to the systematic uh, abuse of animals, um, which I think is very much related to the abuse of human animals. Uh, um, the way in which capitalism encourages a prioritization of profit over everything else has had disastrous effects on uh, the production of, of, of meat. Uh, and of course, all over the world, um, uh, if, if, if one looks at um, the cattle industry, uh, for example, if one looks at the chicken industry, one uh, sees that um, the industrialization of food production has led to a situation in which um, none of those involved actually reflect on what this process looks like from the vantage point of the animals uh, who are raised and then and then killed. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not suggesting that you have to be a vegan in order to have this uh, awareness. Uh, uh, in my opinion, it's a question of capitalism, uh, and you know, just as capitalism leads to structural racism that um, uh, plagues so many institutions and so many individuals, uh, so capitalism leads to forms of production, industrialized production of food uh, that uh, results in systematic violence, systematic abuse. So I, I, I think it's a question of helping to encourage a, a greater and more popular awareness of, of the damage uh, that global capitalism has done and continues to do to this planet. Uh, COVID-19 uh, is a direct consequence of global capitalism, for example. That, that's actually my next question. Um, another thing that COVID-19 has, has made obvious is that the destruction of nature, intensive farming, mining, as well as the exploitation of um, wild species, have created a, a perfect storm for, for the spillover of diseases. Uh, another thing, a recent study in the UK revealed that the, the, the fact that there's less pollution in the last two months has, has saved at least 11,000 lives in Europe. So in a way, we, we know what is wrong, right? But a world where facts would change minds still seems quite far away. How, how do we explain that? Well, of course, uh, it's not enough to simply uh, present the facts or present the truth. We know this by now. Um, ideology uh, consists in creating um, ways in which people understand and imagine their relationship to the world. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, there are those who, who believe that um, climate change is non-existent. Uh, and, I, and of course, I'm talking about, uh, especially about uh, uh, the um, current occupant of uh, the White House in Washington. And, you know, all of those with whom um, he is, uh, he feels connected. Uh, um, yeah, it's not enough to simply represent what is going on. We um, have to develop strategies that uh, allow us to um, help people recognize the work that ideology does. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, among other things, it prevents us from recognizing the catastrophic uh, transformations that have happened as a direct result of, of, of capitalism. Uh, uh, you know, how, um, how cities are so polluted uh, uh, that uh, it becomes really quite remarkable during these times of COVID-19 to witness, you know, what the city should really look like, uh, what Delhi should look like, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you know, people are, for the very first time, uh, viewing mountains that surround urban areas that have been so polluted as a result of, 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 of the fact that uh, auto, individual automobiles are prioritized above public transportation. Uh, um, in many ways, you can say, and I'm using the words of um, Arundhati Roy, that this pandemic can be a portal, uh, um, and that we shouldn't simply yearn for what existed before the uh, large-scale isolation and uh, shutdown of, uh, of economies and our uh, um, our social distancing practices. Uh, we shouldn't simply look to return to what existed before. Uh, uh, we should use this time to reflect on what's possible. And we see uh, that it is possible to inhabit a world without the kind of uh, pollution and climate change that will, of course, ultimately spell the end of, uh, of life on this planet. Uh, um, we should recognize, you know, for example, that, um, that, that congregate living settings, like uh, particularly those that involve repression, like jails and prisons uh, that have become cauldrons, uh, you know, for uh, this virus, uh, that, that uh, these institutions do not have to become a constant um, uh, aspect of human history. We can abolish them. And of course, now the only solution with respect to jails, prisons, detention centers, and so forth is to release people uh, because there's no way to social distance. Uh, there's no way to engage in the kind of hygienic uh, practices that are encouraged to keep people from um, uh, being exposed to uh, the virus. Uh, yeah, Arundhati Roy said that this time can be a portal. And I think that we can reflect on what is possible uh, so that once we emerge from this situation, we're not content with reality as it existed before, but that we move in a direction of a more um, just and cleaner future. I was actually reading a, co a couple of days ago, I was reading that 70% um, of tested inmates in federal prisons in the US have COVID-19. Um, so I, I know it's a very long answer, but how can we ach achieve urgently uh, decarceration for the millions of people cage in jails and detention centers in the US and around the world? Well, that has to be our demand. And I should say that uh, um, as we speak, uh, there is a demonstration currently happening outside of the gates of San Quentin, a, a demonstration of automobiles uh, with um, slogans attached to the exterior of the cars, uh, uh, a demonstration organized by the Labor Action Committee uh, for the Freedom of uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, and largely by members of the Union uh, International Longshore Workers, uh, ILWU. Uh, uh, and they are, they are demanding decarceration. Uh, you know, we, we begin by 
insisting that especially those who are the most vulnerable within the most vulnerable populations, that is to say populations in jail and prison, uh, should be released. And we're talking about um, people who are older. And of course, prisons age people much faster than uh, the process occurs in the so-called free world. So we're really talking about people over 50 years old. We're also talking about people who have been in prison uh, for so long uh, that, uh, um, that they, um, like um, Leonard Peltier, for example, uh, um, can be among the longest held political prisoners uh, in, in the country. Leonard Peltier, David Gilbert, Mumia Abu-Jamal, uh, but we're also talking about uh, releasing people who shouldn't be in prison. Uh, the jails should be emptied. Uh, jails are a place, of course, in the US where people awaiting trial are incarcerated. And those who are uh, convicted uh, of uh, offenses that carry less than a year um, imprisonment. And so we're demanding that all the jails should be emptied uh, and that prisons uh, should be subject to a process of decarceration. There are 2.3 million people behind bars in this country. You know, even if, even if we reach a point where it is safe to continue uh, without social distancing and without all of the hygienic practices that we've been engaging in over the last two months. And the virus is still uh, afflicting people behind bars, uh, uh, then we will never reach the point where we can, you know, actually say we have defeated uh, uh, COVID-19. I'm gonna give you two numbers. Um, in Georgia, USA, 80% of hospitalized African Americans. Also, I was reading that between mid-March and early May in New York, 40 people were arrested for social distancing violations. Out of these 40 people, 35 were Afro-Americans. So what does this say about America today? You know, for a long time, we've been talking about structural racism, the racism uh, that does not necessarily present itself uh, as, uh, as an aspect of the attitudes of individual people. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that, that racism has been embedded in the major institutions, the major social, economic, political institutions uh, for the entire um, length of the history of, 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 of this country. Um, and and, and, and it's, 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 it's interesting that this is a period uh, that, um, this is a historical period uh, that has uh, um, allowed for the recognition of uh, what we call structural racism. Of course, some of us have been talking about this forever, for decades and decades. But finally, I think, you know, largely as a result of all of the work against um, police violence, uh, institutionalized police racism that is connected to um, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, but also uh, the work that's connected with Palestine. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the idea that racism is embedded in institutions and educational institutions and healthcare institutions and housing uh, in, um, in the economy writ large. Uh, uh, but, but especially and perhaps most dramatically in the prison system, you know, what is called mass incarceration uh, is, 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 is really a consequence of, uh, of what, what you might call racial capitalism uh, uh, and uh, the overwhelming uh, disparity, not only of, of black people, but also of Latinx uh, uh, people and, 
and indigenous people um, within jails and prisons in the US. Uh, uh, this is what has driven what we call mass incarceration. It's not just mass incarceration, it's, it's mass incarceration inflicted on racialized communities. Uh, and, and so it seems that uh, during this period when people are uh, pointing to the fact that, uh, that black people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, uh, uh, that there should be some way of putting the two together. Uh, you know, why is it that the jails and prisons are overwhelmingly black and, and, and people of color, and at the same time, the impact on communities of the coronavirus can be seen much, uh, um, is much more devastating when it comes to black communities and Latinx communities and, and indigenous communities, reservations. Uh, this, you know, what we are witnessing is a consequence of capitalism, of global capitalism. And, um, I'm, I'm hoping that the insights that are emerging now stay with us uh, so that uh, we, we won't claim victory uh, when you know, all of the cities and states are opened up again, but we will see that as a, as, as, as a, as a, um, uh, as a mandate, as a time that in which work is mandated on racism within the healthcare system. Uh, and of course that healthcare system is the healthcare system that has been created by capitalism. Uh, as a matter of fact, there never would have been these kinds of uh, uh, shortages and uh, hospital crises uh, had um, the healthcare system not been almost completely privatized uh, using um, you know, re recognizing empty hospital beds as uh, 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 as a um, cause of the declining profitability of the particular hospitals, uh, uh, recognizing shortages of supplies uh, as a result of the just-in-time production um, policies that are linked to global capitalism. Uh, you know, I like what, what Mike Davis has said uh, and, uh, with respect to this crisis created by the coronavirus. He says that it indicates that in this era of global capitalism, uh, we need a global healthcare system that is not linked to private industry. And I think he's absolutely right where that is concerned. I want to end um, by asking you about the killing of um, a Maud Arbery. How can we work to subvert people's carceral desires uh, and, um, and more broadly, people's policing behavior towards, one, towards other people? Yeah, well, you know, um, unfortunately, we tend to think about uh, 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 vigilante violence, racist vigilante violence and racist police violence in terms of particular incidents. So of course we have the case of Trayvon Martin in uh, 2012, which we remember uh, George Zimmerman was the, uh, uh, the, the vigilante uh, in that case. Uh, you know, we have the case of of Mike Brown, who was killed by the police, Eric Garner, and I can name others. Uh, but what we often don't recognize is that um, uh, the, the numbers of people who have been killed by racist police or racist um, vigilante stretches all the way back to the era of slavery. And as a matter of fact, one can, can, can uh, think about the slave patrols, uh, uh, the policing 
uh, process, the policing strategies that have developed over time in this country are very much related to policing strategies that were uh, a consequence of uh, slavery. And um, we've been doing this for decades and centuries. And of course, um, now it should be possible that you know, something has to be changed, uh, that, that not just individuals, we can't just point to the, the man and his uh, father uh, uh, who were responsible for the uh, uh, killing of Ahmad Aubrey, but uh, we have to think about the, 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 the conditions, uh, the ideological conditions, uh, the ways in which racism uh, as a direct consequence of the last uh, national elections. Uh, uh, racism has been legitimized and justified. White nationalism is uh, uh, very much an occupant of the White House. Uh, so I think uh, while, while we should, you know, always be, um, we should always feel deeply for those who have suffered, uh, you know, as a consequence of this racism. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we should recognize that it's not an individual uh, um, matter that, 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 that we have to uh, stand up against white supremacy and, you know, all of the institutionalized forms of white supremacy. Uh, and we have to recognize that a victory in one case is not going to root out the deep uh, racism in all of these institutions uh, that affect uh, people like uh, uh, the men who are responsible for murdering uh, uh, Ahmad Omri. Huge thanks for, for doing this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And right. Good luck to you, Frank. Okay. okay. Bye, Bye Angela. Bye. Bye.